I'll, I'll try not to say anything too bad. All right, so we're recording now. Uh, happy Father's Day to Bill Dowdle. Uh, welcome to the Christ the King uh, interview series. Uh, Bill Dowdle is not going to talk to us about ancient Roman history, uh, but he is going to talk to us um, about something near and dear to his heart, and that's fatherhood. Uh, before we launch into the conversation, Bill and his wife, Winky, are members at Christ the King and have been for a handful of years. And uh, Bill serves on our vestry as our junior warden and is our, I guess, project manager, for the lack of a better term, uh, for our new school building. And I could go on and on. He sings in the choir. Um, and like I said, I could go on and on about both Bill and Winky and what they mean to Christ the King, as well as what they mean to me personally. So welcome, Bill. Thank you. That would be a short conversation if I was going to tell you about Roman history. <laughs> yeah. Well, Tom's got us covered on that. Yes, um, for sure. Uh, so what I thought I would do on this Father's Day is I wanted to... Um, as I reflect on my own uh, fatherhood, I wanted to talk with someone who I admire a lot. And, uh, and so I called you. And the first and foremost, I'd like you to tell me a little bit about your father. Absolutely. I, I'll warn you that when you get me talking about my dad or my children, I can get pretty long winded. Those are two of my favorite subjects to talk about. So feel free to Hook, put the hook out and reel me back in. All right. Um, so Tom Dowdle was born in 1925 in uh, North Birmingham. He was raised in uh, what used to be called the Inglenook suburb of, of North Birmingham. He had one brother, a younger brother, two years younger. Uh, his dad was the foreman of a steamship uh, excuse me, a steam shovel crew for uh, what used to be called TCI. At that time, that was Tennessee Coal and Iron. So my paternal grandfather went to, well, both my grandfathers went to work every day wearing coveralls and, and in this case, uh, a hard hat. Mm -hmm. uh, during the Depression, uh, their family spent some time near uh, Vance, Alabama in Tuscaloosa County in Western Alabama, where they owned a little bit of property that could be farmed and hunted, uh, helped when it came to getting something to eat uh, through those times. Uh, during the Korean War, uh, dad served uh, in the Navy for a few years as a Navy metal smith. He predominantly worked on uh, fighter planes that had gotten shot up needed to be put back together. He was stationed in Virginia Beach, Virginia, where he met Lois Mertens of Spirit Lake, Iowa, uh, who became his wife a couple of years later, and in 1953 became my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, Dad was an architect uh, by education. He spent a year at Howard College in Birmingham before his time in the Navy and then went to Auburn uh, uh, Architecture School on the, VA, on the uh, uh, VA bill after he got out of the Navy and um, made his living his entire career was working in architecture in some form or fashion. Uh, he was a craftsman builder uh, by heart. I enjoy uh, visiting with Daryl Smith, uh, our Daryl Smith, and going to his shop because it reminds me in some ways of uh, work that my dad did. Uh, Dad's entire career was with either the Alabama Power Company Engineering Division or later with the Southern Company uh, Architectural Division. And uh, he died in 2004. Hmm. All right. Well, um... I can see that he handed uh, down uh, some of his uh, skills to you um, and uh, in terms of being somewhat handy. I think that's something that you, uh, uh, may, you may be, know just enough to be dangerous, but you're handy nonetheless. Uh, so yeah, well, thank you for sharing that. 
uh, about your uh, father. What can you give me? I'm sure there's dozens, but can you give me one good memory of him, a, a favorite event or memory of him? It, it, it's hard to give you one, but I'll try to be quick with a few here. So in my adult life, uh, my dad was probably my best friend mm. and he was an avid fisherman and he gave that to me. Uh, he was an avid Auburn uh, sports fan, particularly a football fan. And of course I was saturated in that. I was typically, I was one of those kids who was probably 14 or 15 before I found out that Auburn was not actually a state that was located between Alabama and Georgia. Mm -hmm. um, he loved having uh, family cookouts. He had a special barbecued chicken recipe that he shared with all of the neighborhood and the family whenever we would have uh, uh, holiday events. And uh, as I had mentioned earlier, he was uh, a real craftsman woodworker and he had a little bitty shop set up in our one car garage in Trustville, Alabama, where I was raised. Um, and our typical evening after dinner with mom was cleaning the kitchen up, dad and I would adjourn to the garage where he would work on whatever project he had. And I would sit on the concrete floor and straighten out the nails that he bent uh. while he was trying to build something. And we would listen to, uh, the Grand Ole Opry on a AM radio. So that th those are some of my favorite memories of my dad. I wonder, um, he might have been in that generation. Would he have been at Howard at the same time Bobby Bowden was? Because Bobby Bowden went to college at Howard. Boy, they would have been close. Now, yeah. I never heard him mention that. So um, I, I guess that they weren't fraternity brothers, but... <laughs> Right, but, right. but but they would have had to have been pretty close then. Uh -huh. Yeah, interesting. All right. Well, um, is there one thing that you uh, take away from your relationship with your father? As some wisdom, something you learned? Uh, um... So dad was, he took setting a good example for his children as a pretty serious thing. And I can tell everyone that Tom Dowdle tithed 10% of every penny that he ever handled in his life. Um, was a, one of the things that he taught us was that we really needed to respect our relationship with God and love God before anything else. And right behind that was to invest in and take care of our relationship with our family to protect our family. So th those are the two things that he tried to instill in me. And it's funny, as hard as I fought him on most things when I was young, those are the two things that have, have probably stuck with me the most. Good. Yeah, I, I would concur. I would concur. Well, not only did you have a wonderful uh, father who left, left you a um, remarkable legacy, you yourself are now and have been for a while a father. So tell me about that. Tell me about your children, Bill. Well, this is, this is my next favorite topic to talk about. So any time that I ever in my life needed to try to impress somebody, uh, the first thing I've always done is introduce them to my children because they were the most impressive thing that, that uh, I had or had to do with. Um, my oldest daughter is Deanne. She's married to a fellow named Steve Philhauer lives in Montgomery, Alabama, and Deanne has two of my three grandchildren, uh, granddaughter Hunter, who is nine, and grandson Davis, who is 12. Deanne was uh, the, uh, 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 without embarrassment, was the smartest of all of us. Uh, <laughs> she is just a beautiful, great uh, person, is a tremendous mother, uh, and thank goodness is the one who is even killed and uh, works pretty hard at being a peacemaker, which is often needed in, in uh, this outfit. My middle daughter is Kate, who's married to Ben Kaiser. 
they live in Savannah and she has my youngest granddaughter, uh, Charlie Harper Kaiser, who is just five months old. Hmm. Uh, Kate is the most magical and artistically talented uh, of the three. She basically is a Disney character, hmm. uh, or maybe a mix between a Disney character and Wonder Woman, maybe hmm. would be a good way to put that. And then my youngest is a son, Will. Will's single, he lives and works in Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh, Will turned out to be a little bit of a late bloomer. Uh, he has a bit of an athletic side. He is a, an amateur uh, rock climber, among other things. Is extremely handsome, smart. He's a right thinking, uh, good hearted and has grown into a better and more capable person than I ever dreamed of. Mm. Um, so anyhow, all three of my children are just outstanding people and the kind of folks that we need more of in our society today. Good. Well, yeah. Um, thanks for uh, sharing. And I've heard you uh, glow about them before, so it's, it's good to hear it. But I've never heard them all spoken of in one fell swoop. So it's good uh -huh. to get them in that sort of order. Um, what's been the most challenging thing about fatherhood for you? Who, um, that can be a long one too. Um, you know, people often accuse men in general of thinking that they should be able to control everything. And I guess it's understandable at least in my case, that you would think that at least where your children are concerned, you should be able to control most things. Well, that's just an incorrect way to look at things from the get go. And what we can do is certainly we can try to set the best example for them that we can, but you really can't control very much. And uh, it, that was a difficult, thing for me to understand. Having two beautiful, popular daughters, I had a lot of sleepless nights, you know, and I used to think, oh, if I can just get these girls through high school and get them off to college where I'm not, you know, living every moment, worrying about every move that every person makes that's in their life, I'll be fine. And I can, you know, I the, the, the third one's a little guy. I can knock him around if I need to. That's not going to be that much trouble. Right. But of course, I wound up having more sleepless nights over my son than I did the, the two girls combined. So it probably, um, it was tough for me to realize that the important thing wasn't really trying to control things. It was how we responded to the challenges that life is inevitably going to throw up. And, you know, th those hurdles that are going to come up in front of you. So mm -hmm. fortunately, God has smiled on me unbelievably. And we never really had any problems that were that big that we couldn't find a way to either knock that hurdle down or get around it. Yeah. Well, I'm glad to know that I'm not the only uh, father who can't control their kids because <laughs> yes, you, uh, you might as well go ahead and get on the team Richard yeah what's been one of the more rewarding things about being a father I'm sure the list goes on but well well I'll tell you what that's that's really an easy one for me it's right now right now is the I, I have crossed the goal line now, I may be sorry I'm saying these things, and I know it probably sounds like I'm bragging, but life, is, aside from the fact that we're in a global pandemic and the stock market's gone to heck, and, you know, for, from my family personal standpoint, uh, you know, we may have had lots of struggles, and there were times when you just had to keep punching. You just had to keep on punching because you couldn't really see what was the right thing to do. You just knew you, you had to keep moving ahead. But boy, hasn't it worked out 
in the end beautifully because you know I'm so proud of my children. They're all exactly where they need to be, doing what they need to be doing, where they need to be doing it. Um, it's just extremely gratifying. And when I look at my three grandchildren, I think about the legacy that they're going to generate for the whole family. Mm -hmm. uh, again, it's just a miracle. It's a miracle straight from God. I don't know what I did to deserve this, but I'm thankful that it's happening because it couldn't hardly have worked out any better. Well, uh, as your priest, Bill, I can remind you that you don't deserve it uh, because <laughs> none of us deserve the grace, love, and mercy that God has bestowed upon us, but we take it as a gift and we try to do the best with that gift, but none of us deserve it, Bill. Uh, but, uh, well, lastly, do you have any advice or, um, you know, words of wisdom for younger parents and fathers like myself who are just trying to, you know, get through, uh, you know, potty training and all that, but we've got a long road ahead. What, what advice do you have for me and other young fathers who are listening? Well, so here's the value and the advice that I can give you is that you already know, and I'll tell you up front, this is advice that comes from having done it wrong. I've done it all wrong as many times and survived it somehow and still wound up with incredible children. Uh, so, so there is some real life experience coming in these. Uh, one, one thing I would say is don't be afraid to let your kids earn the stuff that they want and the stuff that they need. Um, in, in my life and probably more in my generation, you know, we had the benefit of being raised by people who had lived through the depression, but we didn't have to live through the depression mm -hmm. and we wanted to give our kids everything. You know what? That's probably not the best plan. Let, let folks work to earn what they need. And, and if they have to go without some of what they want, that's probably okay too. Uh, I would say that part of that is let your kids fail mm -hmm. and prove to, or show them that failure is not that bad. It's okay. Mm -hmm. And what's more important is learning how to fail better next time is really the, the, the trick there. Mm -hmm. uh, I would say that there's just no way that, you'll ever be able to invest too much time in the stuff that your children do. If it's sports, if it's chess club, if it's going to summer school, if it's whatever it is, when you think you're exhausted and you just can't go to that volleyball tournament one more time, and you, I promise you, when you're 66 and you're looking back on your life, those are going to be the most fun times and they'll be the things that that uh, your children will remember the most about you too and then I, I guess the last piece of advice i'd give is that in everything that you do just make sure that your children know that you love them and that whatever you're doing, even if it doesn't seem like you're loving them when you're doing it, that your action that you're taking is because you care about them and you want the best for them. And, and it doesn't hurt to tell them that. Mm -hmm. You think they don't listen to you, but years later they play it back to you and you're glad you, you let them know that when you gave them that spank in or when you took the thing away from them that they wanted or you let them fail it was it was because you were really looking after their best interest in the end if they if they know you love them and they know that you're going to do whatever you can to protect them that's the thing that that they need the most good well um words of sage wisdom and um i'm honored to know you as a friend and um thank you and know that you're a, a great father and I can have a lot of good examples, my own father and uh, folks like you. Uh, so I'm blessed at Christ the King to be surrounded by several men uh, like you and, and 
the others who I think are good role models for me. And so I'm blessed uh, by your presence and our church is blessed by you um, on our vestry and all the work you do. And I know your kids are blessed to have you. So um, happy day to you, my friend. Well, thank you for all of those kind words, Richard. I appreciate it. May I ask you a question? Sure. Give me, I, I know your dad and I love him and what an extraordinary person he is. Give us one story about you and your dad that is just one of those magic, wonderful things. Oh, man. I think it would be um, when I was, gosh, by elementary school age, uh, we lived on the south side of town, um, uh, right by close to Florida A&M University, FAMU. And in between our house and Florida A&M was Shell Oyster Bar. And it uh, was a hole in the wall. I mean, this day and age, it wouldn't pass a inspection to, you know, in the first five minutes. Sounds like my kind of place. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but they were open and every uh, Saturday, dad would get me and we would get in the car and go down to Shell Oyster Bar and sit up on, on these bar stools at this dirty old counter. And this guy would shuck oysters on the half shell and you know put them on the tray with the saltines and the uh, cocktail sauce and there'd be an old you know probably black and white or just rickety old tv you know up on the shelf where we'd watch college football i mean if it was a home game we would be at the fsu game but if it was an away game we'd go up to shell oyster bar and eat raw oysters and watch football on that old tv and I was young. I mean, I was elementary school, but it, he got me to love raw oysters. He got me to love college football and just that part of living in North Florida, just fresh oysters. And, um, and I felt such, like such a cool grown up because all the other people at the bar, oyster bar bellied up to the bar were men, you know, grown men and drinking beer and eating oysters. And then there I was, you know, thinking I was cool. And, uh, and I felt cool, but that was um, th probably the best memory as a youngster of me and my dad. Well, I knew I liked your dad already. I really love him after that story. That is just one of the coolest things I've ever heard. Yeah. My I kind of guy. Still love, you know, still love oysters and uh, college football and, going to places like that so yeah well, let's go get some oysters sometime yeah let's do it let's do it all right well uh, god bless you bill and god bless winky and uh, your three kids and your three grandkids and uh, see you soon all the same to you richard happy father's day all right thank you bye bye-bye